Main type of steppe politics was simple enough. When one of the tribes became too strong, the other tribes were united against it. The variety of unions was explained by a large number of inter-clan relations. Unity or dissension of clans in the same tribe as well as friendship or rivalry of leaders. Transitions of his army were not measured in kilometers, but in degrees of latitude and longitude. The whole Christian world quaked to one name, Genghis Khan, and Muslims were convinced that all his actions were actions of a supernatural creature. Rustan Rahman Aliyev, the Turks Empire, Great Civilization. History has recorded the existence of peoples who spoke Mongolian languages long before the emergence of tribes who together with Genghis Khan gave this name to the whole group, just as we learned about the Turkus before the Turks. So Mongolian-speaking peoples included the Senpais, 3rd century, the Jujuans and Hethelites, 5th century, and the Avars who lived in Europe in 6th-9th centuries. It is generally recognized that the Kitans, who played a big role in the 8th century, spoke Mongolian dialect. As for the pure Mongols, in the 12th century they were divided into many Ulusus. Ulus means both a tribe and a small nation, for example, Vladimirtsev interpreted the word Ulus as a nation or nationality. He translated the word Irgen as a tribe and Ulus Irgen as a state. These independent tribes were constantly at odds with each other and with their neighbors. According to Gruse, the family from which Genghis Khan came, belonged to a branch of Borjigin's Kiyats clan. After Timujin became Genghis Khan, Mongol tribes began to be divided into two categories, on membership or non-membership to the Kiyats. The first belonged to the category of Miruns, Sons of Light, Pure, and the second, Durlukins, belonged to the second class. Among the Miruns were Taijigots, Taichuts, or Taijuts, who lived apart from the main mass to the east of Lake Baikal, Uruts and Mankuts, Jaijurats or Juirats. Barlasses, Barins, Dorbans, Dorbots, Saljiguts or Saljuts, and Katagins or Katakins. Durlukins group consisted of Arulats or Arlats, Bayauts, Karalasses or Korlasses, Sulduses, Ikirasses, and Kongirats, Ongirats, Kunkurats or Kongrats. The latter lived in the southeast, in the region of the North Kingan, near the Tatars. Halkha Mongols who lived in the east were the future Dungars and Kalmyks. We call them Barungars and Zungars. They were left wing and a right wing. They differed from each other, and there were also Oirats and Eirats. Eirats were steppe tribes as Mongols, and Oirats were forest tribes. Among Mongol tribes, to the future Dungars, the following tribes were referred Shurosis, Turgauts, Koshauts, and Hoits. 
The right wing and the left wing existed all the time. Those who went to the West became the future Jungars. They were formed as a separate nation. And Halha Mongols are the modern Mongols. Maybe the Eastern tribes were in the majority in its population. In spite of this, they were split into Eastern and Western. All tribes had the left wing and the right wing. We don't know who the pure Mongols were. And currently it's hard for us to say who the Mongols are. My descendants will wear clothes made of fabric embroidered with gold. They will eat dainty dishes, ride on magnificent horses, hug the most beautiful young women, and they will forget to whom they owe for all that. Attributed to Genghis Khan. From the viewpoint of their lifestyle, Mongol tribes in the late 12th century can be theoretically divided into steppe tribes who lived in the steppe regions and tribes of hunters and fishermen who lived in the woods. At the head of the steppe of cattle, tribes who were more prosperous, there was a very influential aristocracy and its leaders had titles of Batu, hero warrior, Noyon, chief master, as well as Sechen, wise, Bilge, wise in Turkic language, and Taishi, Chinese title of prince. On the stage below the aristocracy, there were other social classes. or other people mostly free, no course, common people, Karachu, and finally slaves, Bogols. The latter category included not only individual workers, but also whole conquered tribes, of whom, among other things, auxiliary troops were recruited. In practice, separation between stock raising and forest peoples was not so obvious. For example, the real Mongols, Tai Chuuts, were forest hunters, but Genghis Khan came from a tribe of herdsmen. On the other hand, all the Turk Mongols were in some way hunters. In winter, on wooden or bone skis, forest people hunted beasts for subsistence and trade. Herdsmen hunted using a lasso or bow. Steppe aristocracy preferred falconry. Any clan could change the way of life, depending on the environment. When Genghis Khan was young, his parents' stock was taken away, and he, along with his mother and brothers, had to struggle for survival, to hunt and fish, before he got back his legal horses and goats. However, in general, it is obvious that in Mongolia there was a regress in 12th century in comparison with the 9th century. In the period of Mongol rule in the Orhon, Turkic tribes, especially the Uyghurs, began to create agricultural centers. Since the time of Kyrgyz domination, since 840, this progress stopped, the country returned to the steppe lifestyle. Although there is still a question, what we call regress. But anyway, the Uyghur's inscriptions in the Orhon indicate the level of civilization, which we do not see in Genghis Khan's history. Many words transferred from Turkic into Mongolian language indicate the cultural superiority of the Turks over the Mongols. According to Bartold and Pope, the same can be said about languages of the Turks and Mongols. Modern Mongolian language in any region seems archaic in comparison with the most ancient Turkic languages. Written Mongolian has
has remained, in the sense of phonetics, almost at the same level as was primitive Altai language, that is, Turkic Mongolian. В истории так не бывает однозначно, да? Мы не можем говорить, это регресс или прогресс, и это была очень такая сложная, да? In history, it doesn't happen definitely. We cannot say if that was a regress or a progress. It was a different, complicated stage of development. If, for example, we compare the Turkic Empire and the Mongol Empire in the time frame, we cannot even compare them. But in the Mongol Empire, there were traditions of the Turkic statehood. They were very popular, and it wasn't denied. Because the key word was nomads. They were nomads. The nomadic production method was the extensive way of development. It required a lot of new pastures. With increase of livestock, necessity of movement arose. I mean in the territorial sense, in expansion. In this sense, both Turkic and Mongol empires had common roots. With regard to regress and progress, there is no conjunctive mood in history. I don't like this expression, but in fact it is so. If at present we assess what would have happened if it hadn't been for the Mongol period, it is difficult to judge. Perhaps then that had been a very slow, strange process. That had been at the level of isolated tribal unions. The process of formation of statehood, ethnic consolidation, would have been much slower. Relations of another kind were involved, and the Mongol Empire was a pattern in terms of communications. It created a system of communications. The greatest masterpiece of human is to live in time. Montaigne. As for the name Mongol, it escaped oblivion thanks to freak of history. Accidental belonging of the future Emperor Genghis Khan to one of the Mongolian clans. With his coming to power, all the tribes of Mongolia were united under his leadership, and there was formed a new nation known as the Mongols. In fact, they were the Turk Mongols. Regarding the word Mongol, people talk a lot now. Some people say Mongol is Mangalik Yel, eternal people. We know that since the time of nomadic states, the Hans and the Turks created their states, they thought it would be forever. Now some people interpret the word Mongol as in Mangalik Yel. Some associates the word Mongol with Minkol, a thousand warriors. Therefore, it is difficult to say by what word the word Mongol was originated. There are different versions, 1,000 warriors and others. It is worth recalling in this context that during step wars, defeated peoples joined the winners, and as it is said in an ancient text, they gave them power and strength. Along with different clans that formed the core of Genghis Khan's troops, under his power there were great Turkic-speaking tribes. Naimans, Kirates, Onguts, Karluks, Kurgizes, Uyghurs and Tatars. In other words, as Ru noted, for one Mongol there were seven Turks.
The struggle for domination of the supreme power in the steppe between the nomads was long and hard. In the early 12th century, under rule of Kobul Han and Ambagai Han, Mongol tribe dominated. However, in 1161, the Churchens and Tatars inflicted a major defeat upon the Mongols. Kobul Han's grandson Yesuge was no longer a Khan and held the title Bagatur. Nevertheless, he remained a major figure. Being successful in campaigns and raids on other tribes, Yesuge Bagadur had many subjects and large herds of cattle. He died suddenly around 1165, poisoned by his enemies, the Tatars. After Yesuge Bagadur's death, the Ulus collected by him fell apart. The most powerful tribes became the Tatars, grown near Lake Buyur-Nur. The main type of steppe politics was simple enough. When one of the tribes became too strong, the other tribes were united against it. The variety of unions was explained by large number of inter-clan relations, unity or dissension of clans in the same tribe, as well as friendship or rivalry of leaders. Vassalage and loyalty to one overlord or to a sworn brother lasted as long as they seemed politically beneficial for both sides and before the friendship was overshadowed by resentment. In this mobile feudal society of the steppes, any vassal by custom had a right to challenge his overlord and to offer his services to another one. Therefore, even if the tribal leader succeeded in creating a large kinate, his power was never hard. The state formed by him could fall apart as quickly as it was founded. The game could go endlessly, and it went until Genghis Khan changed the rules. Такой интересный феномен получился, потому что с одной стороны монголы. This is an interesting phenomenon. On one hand, the Mongols came and conquered, established their socio-political system, which existed in the territory of Kazakhstan until the middle of the 19th century. The same was in the Emirate of Bukhara, Kokan Khanate, and Khanate of Kiva. Georgia clan's members ruled there until the mid-19th century. And this political order which the Mongols had established, I mean their political order and statehood, existed for a long time before arrival of the Russian Empire. But on the other hand, from the ethnic point of view, the Mongols were assimilated by the Turks. A famous Arab writer, Alu Mari, wrote that before arrival of the Mongols, it had been the Kipchak's land. And as if the earth swallowed the Mongols, their language and faith became Kipchak. That is, there was an assimilation. Many Mongolian tribes came to the territory of Kazakhstan. Their Turkic speaking is undisputed. For example, the Merkit remained in this territory. Before the great campaign of Genghis Khan, they fled away when he waged wars against Central Asian tribes in the territory of Mongolia. They were also Turkified then. They were called Turkified Mongolian's tribe. They were also Turkified then. They were called Turkified Mongolian tribes. On the other hand, in addition to the fact that the Mongols brought their political order and structure, they violated those slow processes of ethnic development, because before the Mongol invasion the situation was such that on the territory of Kazakhstan at least several ethnic groups were to be formed on Karluk basis, Kipchak bases and Oguz bases. But when all the tribes began to move, there was a migration of both internal and external natures. This order was violated cardinally. And the Mongols accelerated the process of ethnic and political consolidation of the tribes. When all the tribes came to the movement, they started the migration, как внутреннего характера, так и внешнего, этот порядок был коренным образом нарушен. Our horses will take us to the stars.
from ancient Mongolian song. By the middle of the 12th century, Mongol tribes moved to the west from the Orkhon and Karu land, pushing back the Naimans and Kipchaks from the territory of the Mongolian Altai and the upper reaches of the Irtish, assimilating Turkic-speaking groups, taking from the Turks many elements of material culture, forms of economy and way of life, nomadic traditions and livestock breeds. Since then, the borders of Turks and Mongols' location were established and they were preserved until late time. The territory occupied by the Mongols stretched from Lake Baikal, the upper reaches of the Irtish and the Yenisei in the north to the Gobi Desert in the south. Between the two poles of civilization, China and India in the east and the Greek-Roman world in the west, extended a binding tape in the form of a long strip of Turkic Mongol peoples. To connect eastern and western civilizations with each other, to organize and protect trade routes, to be supreme arbiters between them, Obviously, Alexander the Great dreamt of that, and Attila cherished the same plan. Amir Timur's intentions were the same, and Napoleon perhaps had the same goal. But in the 13th century, Genghis Khan was destined to proceed to this gigantic task and to bring it to the end with iron and fire. In the early 12th century, the Kalhans laid the groundwork for the future state. A leader named Kaidu rallied several tribes around himself, and his grandson Kobul established relations with the rulers of northern China, first as a vassal, and then, after a short war, as a receiver of a small tribute. But Kobul's nephew and his successor Ambakai was captured by the Tatars and handed over to the Chinese, who killed him. In 1161, the next leader, Kutula, suffered a defeat from China, who marched out in an alliance with the Tatars, and a few years later, Kutula's nephew, Yesugei, was killed by the Tatars. Yesugei's son was Temujin, the future conqueror of the world, known as Genghis Khan. But let's start from the beginning. Future Genghis Khan's father, Yesugei Batur, was the leader of Kiyats clan, branch of Borjigin's family. Timujin, on his father's side, was a great-grandson of powerful Kobul Khan who dared to fight not only against the Tatars, but also against the Chinese. Kobul Khan was one of the first who sought to unite the Mongol tribes. Yesugei Batur was on a par with his grandfather in courage and also waged wars against the Tatars and Tsin army. He had a huge popularity in the steppe society. However, when he decided to marry, he had to reckon with the clan's customs that forbade to marry within their own clan. Everyone knows that Yesugei Bahadur got his wife as a spoil of war, that is, he took her away from a Merkit warrior. If we get a view of the steppe traditions, making choice of a bribe, if we get a view on the steppe traditions, making choice of a bride, becoming co-parents-in-law, 
people whose children marry each other, and there we can see certain regularities. In epics and fairy tales we find such things as Bessie Kudalik and Karin Kudalik, when parents agree in advance of their children's marriage. First of all, this is due to the fact that there was a taboo on incest up to the seventh generation. First of all, this is due to the fact that there was a taboo on incest up to the seventh generation. Just imagine, in a radius of several tens, perhaps hundreds of kilometers, there were blood relative relations. And the young people had to look for brides beyond their clumps. Often friends who became Andas, sworn brothers, established such blood relationships to strengthen their future relationship and never to be parted. They were Karin Kuda, that is, they made a match of the children in the womb. If someone has a boy and the other has a girl, they gladly bring them together. In the same way, we can talk about Besik Kuda. In the case of Genghis Khan, his father, according to the traditions, went to his wife's relatives to look for a bride for his son Timujin. Oelun was born as a wise wife. She raised her little children like this. She ties a cap tighter. She ties the waist belt of the dress higher. She runs up and down, river or none. She gathers grain by grain from the bird cherry and wild apples. Both day and night, she nurtures her children. Secret story. According to the version stated in Secret Story, Yesugi met his wife at the very romantic circumstances. During falconry, he saw a rider from Merki tribe who carried to his camp a young beautiful woman sitting in a cart. He rushed after them in pursuit. Merki disappeared and Yesugi captured beautiful Oelun. Anyway, the beauty of all Kanao tribe became Yesuge Batur's wife. The name Oelun means great. Mongolian chroniclers called her wife of honor, advice, mind and cold determination. In her appearance there was not only courage, readiness to exploit, but also femininity and selfless motherly love. Genghis Khan's mother, as well as her son, are a unique phenomenon in Mongol's history. Oelun was the first woman described in chronicles who rebelled against old customs in a nomadic society. It was such a bold move, and people moved away from her, so she couldn't infect others with her behavior. At the same time, the relatives took all the property of deceased Yesuge Bagatur to call the cattle and thus condemned the family to starvation. But we must give proper respect to the mother. She inspired her children by her example and became a pattern of courage for them. In addition to her five children, Oelun took under her wing the younger wife of her deceased husband and her two sons. But what was the result of her determination? The whole world knows now. But more about that you will know in our next episode.